Today on Straight Talk, we are going to discuss two specific product categories that you use frequently, cleaners and degreasers. Now, there could be some confusion in the industry about the difference between them and when you might need one compared to the other and the options you need to know about as a professional. So to clear up this confusion and provide you with the information that you need to make an educated decision on product choices, we welcome Jason Welch to our program. Jason is a microbiologist with the Spartan Chemical Company. Well, thank you for joining us today for this topic. You know, I got asked the obvious question, what do you do at Spartan as a microbiologist? Well, as you said, technically I'm a microbiologist. However, I'm one of the formulating chemists. Uh, I got a degree in applied microbiology from Bowling Green State University, but I minored in chemistry. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've created over 100 products for the company, and everything from categories, obviously, with disinfection, being a microbiologist was one of my specialties, but I've done everything from all-purpose cleaners, degreasers, carpet cleaners, uh, pretty much everything that's not a floor finish or our IPG coolant, although I'd kind of lie a little bit and say that I wouldn't have a little bit to do with it because preservation is usually a, an important part of product formulation that I usually dabble in as well. So, but that's a little bit of background about me. Impressive, 100 products. Now, I'd like you to name all of those in chronological order backwards. Can you do that? Well, how about this? How about I just kind of uh, name drop a few of the more popular products like clean by peroxy, for example, is a oh. product that I created that uh, does very, very well for us. Uh, we have our patented equalizer that I've got four patents for, which is a oxymoronic product where it's a disinfectant that is designed to kill bacteria, but actually has bacteria in it. So that's been a very good product for us, ideally used for stinky restrooms. And then yeah, you know, I did the hand cleaner line. So all our light and foamy products, Prolux and things like that are also a, a big uh, part of our thing. And our food processing line, I can't like, leave that out as well with our egg wash formulation is, is kind of one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on. Well, impressive list of products and of course, popular in, in the industry. So thank you for all you do. And um, sorry for trying to put you on the spot, naming all of them, all hundred of them, but I know you've got them written down somewhere, but yeah, there, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. So I think what we've done here, Jason, we set you up as the experts. Let's dig into our topic. Um, we know there's a lot of cleaners on the market. I've heard them referred to as degreasers. So help our listeners make sense of the cleaner landscape, what they need to know about cleaners and the factors to consider when choosing products. Well, it's a great question. And you're right. There's been a lot of confusion in the industry over what type of product to use. And I'm just going to state the obvious here. The first thing that you really need to consider is what am I using the product for? You know, if I'm just a building service contractor and my job is to clean an office space, then maybe using a high power degreaser that's got a lot of solvent in there is not the best idea where something a little bit more surface compatible, you know, like a clean by peroxy, for example, would be a much better choice. Um, you know, one of the things you gotta consider are the types of soils that you're going to be cleaning. As I said, you know, office building is gonna have a certain soil level versus a actual dirty kitchen. Um, so there's different products that are designed for those sort of things. When it comes to all purpose cleaners, they are exactly what they say, all purpose. So they are formulated in the sense that they are going to be safer on surfaces as compared to certain degreasers. You know, degreasers are high alkaline products. So if you go to the pH scale, for example, you know, part of the soil selection that you choose is, okay, if I'm in the kitchen, you know, those have a lot of fatty acids. So you have acidic soils and that's why you use a alkaline cleaner because you're kind of doing the opposite to track thing. Where if you're in a restroom where you have soap scum and, uh, you know, scale buildup, those are actually alkaline based soils. So that's why your acid cleaners work really well. But generally speaking, all purpose cleaners are going to be fairly neutral. I mean, you can go as high as a pH of around 10, 10 and a half and still be safe for certain surfaces. And you can go as low as, you know, two or three in certain situations. Um, you know, one of the big myths actually, I, I, as I'm thinking about it is like during the winter time when you have a lot of different soils being tracked into a building uh, due to ice melt. And a lot of the times I get, you know, hey, we need to neutralize ice melt. Well, technically you're not going to be neutralizing any ice melt because salt in itself is in its most neutral form. 
um, where ultimately you want to have a cleaner that's got a good solvency or at least water to dissolve the salt and then enough surfactant and dispersing agents in there to clean up the dirt and soil that gets attracted in with the salt and the stuff in that wintertime aspect of things. So um, just a little bit of an insight from the difference of a, an all-purpose cleaner versus kind of a degreaser. You know, in a, in a kitchen setting, when you've got the fatty acids, you're going to want to saponify and neutralize that. But there's often not a need for that sort of cleaning application on an all-purpose thing. Let's talk about the pH scale a little bit more. Now, you mentioned some important information already, but take us through the different soil types, applications, and which pH range we should be looking for. All right. Well, the pH scale probably needs to be explained first. So what the pH scale is, is technically the negative log of the hydrogen ions in a solution, which is a very complex mathematical formula, which we don't really want to get into. But essentially, it's a pH range of 1 to 14, with 1 being the acid side of things. And then as you go to 14, you get more alkaline. Typically, a perfectly neutral product is 7. And I kind of mentioned a little bit about salt neutralization, the hydrochloric acid and the sodium chloride sort of thing. When water is at a perfect pH of 7, you exactly have a balance between hydrogens and the hydroxyl group. The hydroxyl group is what gives the alkaline portion of it, and the hydrogen is what gives it the, al the acid portion of it. So when those are at neutral, that's a perfect pH of 7. Now, in our industry, we kind of talk about alkaline products, acid products, and then, you know, kind of neutral products. Our industry will basically take products that are between a pH of five and sometimes as high as 10, usually five to nine are considered neutral type of products where once you start getting above nine and a half to 10, all the way up to 14, you're in the very alkaline stage of, of products. And then anything below five, you're starting to get more acidic. That's a little bit about the pH scale. Now, when it comes to neutral or all purpose cleaners, Sometimes the pH scale isn't necessarily as important um, when it comes to dealing with the soils. I mean, obviously, if you want to do the opposite of the track sort of thing, that's a great starting point. But sometimes soils are somewhat neutral in their, their case. So you go more about the, the surfactant systems that are in all-purpose cleaners, and you do something what's called emulsification. So if you have a kind of an oily, sooty soil, you can use an all-purpose cleaner on there that will actually help bring oil into water. And that's exactly what emulsification is. It's the process of taking oil, which is not soluble in water, and making it soluble. A little extra science there for you. I like it. I know some of our viewers are, are on the science side. They're kind of techie. I assume that you the products you develop have all this working in them. You explained it, but it's in there. When you buy the product, it's going to do all of the things you described. Yes, yes. One of the fun things about being a formulator is being able to take something that's, you know, really heady and then all of a sudden, you know, you create your solution. But then you've got the reward aspect of it. So, yeah, we can do a lot of different tests in, in the lab. You know, I could throw out some ASTM, you know, 4488 A5 soils, which have a bunch of weird stuff in there. And everything works great in the lab, but sometimes it really takes good field experience uh, for things to happen. So one of the things that we do is we send products out for field testing before they get launched to make sure they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing before we actually go to market with them. Thank you, Jason. Um, let's switch gears a bit. We talked about pH. We learned about saponification, emulsification, and how that all makes good cleaners and degreasers. But tell us this. When does it make sense to use a ready-to-use product versus a concentrate? Ah, very good question. Well, the first thing you got to do is ask yourself, how much product am I going to use? You know, if you're kind of in an office building and you have one person that's just going to clean on a weekly basis, then maybe having a ready to use product is going to be more beneficial to you. That way you don't have to worry about mixing. Um, products are already properly labeled, you know, you know the safety standard of, of it. Um, the product will be preserved in the bottle so you don't have spoilage. But on the other hand, if you're a building service contractor or you have a large use for product, that's when the concentrates come in play and you can set up a dilution control system 
Um, with that, you can have specially labeled bottles. You have to actually have to put in a maintenance program to make sure that the products are diluting properly. Um, so there's a little bit of extra work in there, but in the long run, those things can actually save you money because you're not paying for water or any other sort of packaging aspects of things for the convenience of things. You know, it's really no different than going to the grocery store and whether you're going to buy a bottle of orange juice or you're going to buy the concentrate where you get more for it. So it's the same sort of process when it comes to that. So Jason, when you think about products, I have to think there's people out there when they use your, your products you formulated, that if a little bit works good, if I double it or triple it or use more of it, the concentrate is going to work better. That this can't is, be right. Talk about that. This is an excellent question and it is an often misunderstood thing. As a formulator, if we're making a concentrate, we have a targeted dilution that we are working with to make sure that that is its optimal range. So whether it's six ounces per gallon or even two ounces per gallon, those dilutions are kind of set for its optimal use. Now, what happens is more isn't always better. And a good way to kind of explain this or show people is if you take a bottle of lotion and you put a dime sized drop on your hand, it's usually the right amount. Now, if you really want to kind of make it funny, you can take another hand and then drop a ton of it on their hand and watch them go, well, what am I going to do with this? And then they're looking for legs and everything else because now you have too much. And that's actually what happens with a concentrated product that's not properly diluted. If it's too strong of a solution, you're going to have a lot of residue and sticky stuff. I mean, that's not even going into the aspect of having a concentrated disinfectant when you actually have to have your parts per million at, at its proper use in order for it to work properly. You know, if you sometimes get too strong on that, now you're going to leave sticky residues on the surface um, that actually could be detrimental to people sitting in a chair or on a desk where you can actually get skin burns from the residue from the product on there. So it's actually really important to understand that, yes, I'm using a concentrate, but am I using it at the right appropriate level? All right, Jason, I promise I will never double up on my dilutions anymore. So thank you for that information. Last point I want to cover is if I need to use a cleaning product, if I'm using a one-step cleaner disinfectant, do I need to use a cleaner? Ah, this is an excellent question as well. So I almost have to ask a question back and it's what are you using the disinfectant for? And disinfectants from a formulation standpoint are designed to kill microorganisms. While I should probably should explain what a one-step cleaner disinfectant actually means. A one-step cleaner disinfectant means that it has been tested in organic soil, 5% um, organic blood serum. And what that does is when you're working with active ingredients such as quats or even bleach or peroxide for that matter, those sort of chemistry is going to react with different types of soils, therefore limiting its ability to kill. So when you test in this organic soil, it allows you to make the one step cleaner. So if you do have soil load on the surface, such as a nosebleed and you're kind of following the bloodborne pathogen standard, if you have a one step cleaner, you can be assured that the product is going to work in a soiled environment. However, in that particular case, you need to pre-clean the surface and certain disinfectant products are, yes, they're formulated in the fact that they can clean, um, but they're really designed to kill things. So as a formulator, you're kind of basically trying to thread the needle between making it an okay cleaner and killing stuff. Um, so the one-step cleaner thing usually comes down to what is your purpose of using the disinfectant? If you're a hospital and your surfaces aren't necessarily soiled uh, to the fact of, you know, like you would find in a high traffic building, because soil loads to our naked eye versus a microorganism are two different things. A simple skin cell can actually shield a microorganism from being exposed to the chemical in order for it to kill. So 
you know, one step cleaner is one of those things that I like to caution. So if you're in public places and you're trying to apply hospital infection control procedures to, to that, it's usually unnecessary to use that. And it kind of goes back to the original question of when is it appropriate to use an all-purpose cleaner? And that kind of goes back to, okay, sometimes cleaning is more important than actual disinfectant. So in a public place, when you have constant turnover and you can't keep up with the recontamination of it, maybe a disinfectant isn't usually the best option for that sort of area. Where in a hospital where you have a controlled environment and you can limit the number of people that come in contact with surfaces, that's when the one-step cleaner disinfectant really shines as it can actually help reduce microbial load and actually have a little insurance and actually killing anything that's left on the surface because you have contact time involved with it. So hopefully that answers your question to, to some degree. Otherwise, we can kind of get into a very long discussion on, on this aspect of things. It, it does. And good details. There's, there's so many different situations out there our cleaning professionals deal with. They need to really think about the products they're using and choose the right one for the application. So to get more information about the products you developed and all, all of Spartan's products, where do we get that information? Well, the easiest place to get that is spartanchemical.com. And there's a plethora of information. And there's even a form on there if you wanted to find a regional sales person for that, for your area, and to ask extra questions. That's a great place to start. We've got all sorts of programs on there that you can actually help with selection of products for whatever task you need. All right, Jason. Well, thank you for your information today. And uh, go work on product number 101 now. Thank you.